So this is a question from Michal Rovnil for the first work that you presented. You were talking about creating a generic human. Um, thanks. And um, I was interested in why you wanted to use the trace, because you showed us that your animations of the people walking together were based on photographic material. But in fact, you're the only one who would recognize the photographic trace of that or would have the memory of the actual event. Whereas I, as a viewer, and anyone else here, we would see what we could assume would just be animation. So in the sense of memory, I guess you're the only one who would have the memory of that. So just wondering what you saw the significance of using that photographic trace for the animation. I, I, you know, I'm not sure that it's really true because uh, you saw um, a documentation of something which is reduced and reduced and, and changed size and scale and so on. I, I believe, though, um, that still when you see something that is being uh, documented or excerpted from, from reality, from life, it has a, it has a different feeling. Something really comes through, something remains, even if you, you know, even if I break it, change it, re-erase it, transfer it to another medium even, something that, there's always something there. <coughs> it's the same thing that you, you can recognize even in, in the sculptures that are broken or texts that are erased. There, there is some particles. In fact, I was involved with some, uh, I, I was visiting uh, and working with some scientists at, at Weizmann Institute. And um, I was uh, filming a larva uh, swarm you know, under a microscope and sometimes even cells when they are communicating. And I thought to myself that there is something about this larva. Um, you know what a larva is, uh, the swarm of a, a little fly? I felt that I, there is something about it that I recognize myself in it. It's kind of movement, you know, it's standing there, it's looking to the right, left, it's hesitating, it's moving a bit, it's looking for someone to communicate with. And I felt I, I recognize something in it more than I would recognize in a very perfect, made up, animated person. But that's just my viewpoint. <laughs> Vasana, okay. So is <laughs> sorry, is is Vasana in fact uh, a mean? If I if I in fact connect to to this type of of karmic memory, does this enrich the ego, or is this a form of destabilizing it? Does it mean that I'm all things, or does it mean that in fact I am nothing? Uh, I wouldn't say nothing, but uh, uh, it's a very good question. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I say. Vasana generates or corresponds to Smriti. Smriti is our ordinary memory, conscious, all sorts of conscious uh, mental processes going on right now, but uh, conditioned by the Vasanas which are unconscious. Now, uh, the, uh, our touch, our getting in touch with the Vasanas makes for what's called in Sanskrit Vismriti the opposite of current uh, mental processes going on in the conscious mind. And this might be sort of forgetfulness. But this is forgetfulness which is very deep. It's, we may say, metaphysical forgetfulness. Uh, would, it's definitely an anti-ego kind of process. But the uh, result, well, whether it is nothing, which is, sounds bad, <laughs> whether it is nothing or something other than that, which is the greatest joy in life, that's something else. I really do not know. It's just that these are impressions. When I heard you talking about uh, that karmic life, I mean, I, <laughs> I try to figure if there's an experiment one can do. Uh, but, then, <laughs> um, but then after, you know, I let that thought go. Uh, though it may be possible, but what, what struck me by at least uh, almost all the speakers is that your art is that kind of um, karmic life, uh, or at least that's the connection that I made, and I wondered whether you could co comment on it. 
uh, when I see the pictures from the Holocaust or hear you talking about uh, being born in 1943 uh, or your father, uh, you incorporate that life as if you were living it. And I don't know whether there's that, that connection was deliberate, and I just wondered whether you want to comment on that. Uh, just uh, for research. Of course, research, research is possible. If you look, even for you, you are looking into the brain, and you see that by some processes, all sorts of uh, electric uh, elect comes down. And something else comes up. I mean, this is some kind of a translation of uh, processes uh, spoken about by all sorts of yogis and Indian uh, sages. I can think about some things uh, that could be done because so much of the Yoga Sutra uh, tradition uh, is the diagnosis of human condition. What happens after ple pleasure and attachment, detachment? What what's go what goes on? And all this, uh, this kind of uh, um, um, verb articulations are, uh, could be made, uh, could be translated into the research uh, language. But I prefer not to do that because this means this is a reductionist perspective which I do not like to, to uh, enhance. I would like to speak about the self. With, the self, the real self, and our real self-understanding, and to not to speak about all this kind of, uh, I would say, uh, objectification of men and culture, which, which uh, this is something which I resist, and uh, I don't see research as sorry, just the comment on it. But I'd like to hear the other speakers comment on the same thing. I don't see the research as reductionistic. I see it as opening up. Uh, possibilities and worlds uh, rather than reducing them to uh, objective reality. It's, I, I think, well, anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> can have this conversation later. Uh, the same gentleman. I have uh, begun to make plans about my next, my life and my next reincarnation. And my question is, do you think that's a wise, a wise move? <laughs> if you are interested in truly knowing yourself, and if you are if you think that awareness is ultimately a value, namely something which is not instrumental to anything else, then I would strongly recommend uh, you become a yogi or something else. <laughs> so we'll take one more question and then I have a question and then... Okay, we'll take two because there were two speakers. So we'll... yeah. I have a question which is uh, relevant to uh, Michal and to Nurit, basically. I was, I guess, struck, especially in, in your work, uh, by the uh, role of movement in memory. That is, uh, um, essentially, from an evolutionary standpoint, uh, our memory system is initially a system of ex exploration in space. It's all built essentially on the rodent, which is running in a maze and looking. And it appears like your movement, uh, it's as if the, the movement in itself has a role in the exploration of memory. And I think to some extent, uh, also in, in, in your movie, the, uh, the looking for association and moving from association, some of which are, are not available to consciousness, on a map even. So that's what my, my question about the role of movement. So, you want to answer maybe? No. <laughs> <laughs> you want to hear? In French, in French. How did you make 100 films? Uh, I, did, I did the picture. 
picture that's also you know very beautiful. But um, you know, in my work there is a movement, but there is a usually there is no narrative. It, it is a movement that kind of repeats itself, and uh, you know I, I call them situations. So you know the, there is the search of for something, but but it doesn't get anywhere. It it gets to where it started or it's in its own kind of territory of. Uh, Living. But it is mnemonic, isn't it? What is mnemonic? It's Kuri. It's Kuri? It's Melodetic, memory enhancing, it repeats itself. It's, uh, yeah, if, you, yeah. if you're not sure you got it, you look at it again. And then you look again. <laughs> I think there is, a, there is something you could say that it's a recall, because it's a reappear. There is a recalling something. Right, because that's a way to remember. One is narrative, where you remember a story. One is uh, repetitious, where you don't remember a story. In fact, you remember <coughs> fragments that constantly repeat themselves. And that, that seems to be something that, that you're doing quite effectively, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a question to Michal. You presented your work as a one. One, uh, one work is uh, taking off complexity and abstracting, and then when you get, got to Yad Vashem, you said it's the opposite. But I thought it was the same, because also in Yad Vashem, you decontextualized it and you made it into a universal uh, living. So just a comment on this. How do you see the opposition? Because it was a kind of abstraction in the end on both... Uh, it's a, it's a good question. Yeah, probably in, in, in both cases or all cases, I'm I'm uh, I'm really not interested in the in, in the story itself. Although I did read a lot of uh, uh, books, you know, about, about the subject um, and um, you know, like Friedlander, which is a very you know maybe one of the three books I would recommend for people to read uh, ever. Uh, the Years of Annihilation is just a brilliant book, but I, I, am, I, I really am not looking for the story or, or, or the consideration about it, but, but was very interested to, <coughs> to reconstruct something out of particles of, of, of moments, you know, of lives. So yes, I was looking in fact for moments that could be very universal, <coughs> but the other ones are, are very non-universal. Like, like the, the religious question that is part of, you know, there is also the sound in the sound, you know, there is the religion question, where was God? For instance, because you know in the end, there is a woman singing, which is already a very special thing, but they are singing, uh, uh, yeah, she's singing, you know, my, my, my God and my only God, you know, thank you to God or something like that. And then they sing Lecha Dodi Likrat Kala, Pnei Shabbat. The Shabbat is, a, is, a, is a, you know, like considered the most religious day, but it's also something about a farewell. So, you know, there, were, there was both. I had, in my dialogue with the people of Yad Vashem who kept coming, they always wanted to, you know, they said, what about one woman said, but, but there is no goat, you know, we need a goat, you know, for it to be a Jewish life, or where is this, or where is this, so I, I, I said, okay, give me the list, give me the list of what you need, and then they said, what about some people, like, you know, so yes, there was a Chagall in the window, and, the, uh, and, you know, and there was Einstein coming out of somewhere, and there were all, all these people, but they were, um, yeah, it was a story and not a story. You know, it was really imagining, you know, invented memory, as, as I call this lecture. Okay, wonderful. Thanks so much. I think it was amazing.